Welcome to Killer Women with your host, best-selling author, Danielle Girard. And now, Danielle's next killer woman. Hello, and welcome to Killer Women Podcast, a proud member of the Authors on the Air Global Network with more than 4 million listeners. I am your host, suspense author Danielle Girard, and my guest today is L.K. Bowen. Debut author Lynn Bowen was born in Boston and made her way to Los Angeles to work in the entertainment industry. Like her, like Ellie, her protagonist in For Worse, Bowen has the degenerative eye disease retinitis pigmentosa, which is slowly destroying her vision. To learn more about RP and other degenerative retinal diseases or to contribute to fi finding treatments and cures, please visit www.fightingblindness.org. Welcome, Lynn. Thank you for having me. Glad to be oh, here. It's so fun. It, this was, <laughs> uh, we're, we don't do spoilers, but I will tell you the end of this book. Um, yeah, I had some, I was like, oh no, <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> it's a big twist at the very end, which was super fun. So um, tell us about, this, the book has an interesting premise. Tell us a little bit about For Worse, this, this sort of storyline. Well, the story is about Ellie, who, uh, as it said in the bio, like me, she has retinitis pigmentosa, which is destroying her peripheral vision and her night vision. So she is operating with a uh, a challenge in her life. Um, she is uh, trapped in an unhappy marriage to a man who is very um, controlling uh, and difficult. And uh, she left him once and came back because she ran out of money and nerve. And um, now she's planning on leaving him again. And to bolster herself in this decision, she joins a group of women on a chat room on the internet called Divorced Women Over 50. Or <laughs> Which I love. As we call it. <laughs> and she meets uh, these extraordinary women there, and actually ordinary, extraordinary women. And, um, and she gets into their stories and there are mysteries within the chat room itself and people disappear and people have other uh, stories and she herself tells her story sometimes through the chat room but it's not just that it's it's largely narrative in the chat room or just these forays and then at some point she decides this isn't working for her and she gets a recommendation from the moderator to join another chat room that happens to be on the dark web for women for whom divorce was not the right decision and um, they have another way of navigating a bad marriage. <laughs> right, they do. They do indeed. It's so so. Like you said, so a lot of this, is, the the format of the book is these wonderful chat groups, and it's we do get the point of view of the husband, um, but largely it's a women's book, which of course you know is my favorite subject of, of all times. And and a lot of it, I you know, as everybody who's listened to my podcast knows, I'm recently divorced. It was not my choice. Um, well, I mean, it was my choice, but. I didn't really have a choice because he had had a long affair. So, so many of the things that they talk about and, um, and the ways that they, you know, feel so real to me. So I, I love that because I think one of the things about navigating anything really hard, right. In life is feeling like you are understood in some way. And I think that's what, that's what Ellie finds in this chat group. That's what I found. I find when I'm reading books that, that, you know, the deal with these issues. So I think it's really it's a comfort. So if you're out there and you're in a hard marriage, which I think maybe is just the definition of marriage, right? But you have, <laughs> you, <laughs> but if you have, um, if you have, you know, those thoughts in your head, it's really, it's fun. It was, it's, there's moments where I laughed out loud, which I think is another okay. thing that's really hard to do and, you know, and nice to do when you're going through something really tough. So, so I really appreciated that. Um, and Ellie, you know, and so let's talk about this disease because the way it's described is, it really does. I mean, and her and her husband really uses it against her. Like you said, he's controlling, and he um, he puts her in uncomfortable situations, mostly just for his own sort of, you know, kicks, which is um, which it makes us understand what, especially why she wants out. But tell us what it does. Like it, you know, it sort of starts it's to really narrow your vision. That's exactly right. It does narrow your vision. Um, I like to tell people it's it's not exactly like looking through a roll of toilet paper, but it's sort of like if your vision is a is kind of a square, and um, and you can't see above or below or to the sides. 
So you right. really have to, I walk with a white cane. Yeah. Um, I'm okay in the daylight because it, for some reason, the, the, the daylight sort of broadens the periphery a little bit, mm -hmm. but at night the lights go out. And if I'm in a dark restaurant or in a crowded street, um, I really, I need the cane and I, I need the arm of someone, you know, who, uh, who doesn't mind, you know, um, right. Bit. And for someone who is in a marriage with a person who is using it to hurt her, yeah, um, it's terrifying. And, you know, the thing about Jeff is he, he's not doing it because he likes to pull the wings off of flies Right. He's doing it because he he is terrified of her leaving him, and so he wants to make her know how dependent she must become on him, as opposed to a really supportive partner would be saying, "Go do it yourself." You know, I'm yeah. here, but you don't need me. You know, right. that's to be disabled is to yearn for independence, right, and to fight for it every step of the way, which is what she learns to do. And I think part of her struggle is is this the right thing to do? I mean, if I am disabled, if I'm going to be blind in five years, shouldn't I be married? Shouldn't I have someone in my corner? And they have a daughter. They have a daughter who's in college, Hannah. Yeah. Um, and she she doesn't want to burden her her daughter, of course. No, of course, right. And um, so so she has to decide, you know, what, what price freedom, really. Right, right. Um, and the ch children in general become a factor in divorce, right? I mean, uh, I know for, you know, for a lot of people, the children are not necessarily, you know, they don't necessarily see the sides of their parents that are sort of would be hard to live with. I mean, of course, all children complain about their parents, right? We, you know, they're, but Hannah's actually quite supportive of her mother and realizes the ways in which Jeff is, you know, not an easy partner for, for Ellie. But like you said, like Ellie, Ellie is in a tough position. And is that what happens? Like eventually does it, do you get blind, become blind? Yes. In fact, I'm extremely lucky with this disease because I have so much disease. I was diagnosed at 21 and people who are diagnosed at 21 are blind by 40. Wow. And I'm 68 and I have a lot of vision and I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful every day. And one of the things I want to tell people is be grateful for what you can see. Right. For, I you know. It's right a, it's, a, it's a big gift well first um, of all you don't you don't look at 68 although I'm, I, that's the new you know 38 I'm sure yeah, right. <laughs> exactly <laughs> <laughs> but also that is amazing like yeah I mean 20 that's 30 years of you know vision that that now is it congenital like is it an inherited disease do they know what causes it they do it's uh well there are many different types and there's many different genes they're looking for the gene because if they find the gene they can do an effective gene therapy replacement, gene replacement therapy. Uh -huh. So they say, and that's, we contribute, uh, I do fundraising for the Foundation Fighting Blindness every year for their vision walk. And they do great work um, in funding the research that will end this disease. Um, and yes, the end game is you're probably going to be blind, but I don't know. Um, my, my brother was the only one who had this disease in our family. He passed in 2009 of cancer. It's not related. Yeah, I'm yeah. sorry. Um, our parents didn't have it. My sister doesn't have it. None of our children have it. Oh, which is lovely. Yeah. Thank God. Right. Um, so it's a it's a tricky little thing. And I think that makes yeah. sense. You know, families that have it onto the generations. Yeah. yeah. Right. And so your grandparents didn't, nobody you know had it until you and your brother. Correct. Um, my, my grandparents actually both died. Um, they were hit by a car. My father's parents were hit by a car and yeah. it's possible they were hit by a car because somebody didn't see it. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Is this disease yeah. known or diagnosed until, you right. know, within the last 50 years, maybe. Right. Right. Absolutely. Well, well, you know, that, is, I mean, it is an interesting question because obviously like, you know, I, we assume Ellie got married, um, you know, pretty this generation of people that we have I, mean, I got married at 23 so if oh, you assume she, I know <laughs> I wouldn't recommend it um but no I had 30 wonderful years but I I just feel like you know if you got married really young and you didn't sort of know we, a lot of us do these things right we get married w when we're young and we don't know sort of what sort of genetic 
health lot you know lottery we're going to end up with and so right she's you know if she if you imagine she's not didn't have a lot of opportunity to live on her own before she was with jeff it is i mean there's so many things about it and you don't even need you certainly don't need to have you know a a physical handicap to feel like being like divorcing is terrifying right that is the true that is was my experience and that the people that i have spoken to that is experience it's just like the idea of navigating the world first of all we're women which of course means we're smarter stronger braver more fabulous yeah, all that uh, <laughs> <laughs> but we're also the underpaid sex you know yeah. gender we're the we're the you know the more at risk gender for all sorts of things, right? And it is, there is this terrifying idea of like, can we do this? And you see all of this, I think, in the in the characters in, in For Worse, because, you know, many of, and we were taught, we were raised, and even my, I feel like young for this generation of people that were raised to be like, you sort of are the support, you're the wing man, wing woman to your husband. You're not, you're not supposed to be your own star. Um, and I, hopefully our children, like my daughter is of course, like just so fierce and she is like, there's no effing way I'm going to be anybody's sidekick. And I love that. Um, and my, I, my son, 100%, I think will have a partner who is his equal. And my, I think, I don't think my husband thought of me as his, not as equal, but I think his, because he was the main breadwinner, his life sort of took, you know, front row where he needed to go or do, or if he was going to golf on Wednesdays, it was my responsibility to just like sort of pick up the slack. And I think it does make us feel like we maybe can't do it by ourselves. Right. Um, well, I, and I, I think, um, you know, there's an old, old saying, a woman, a man works from dusk till dawn, but a woman's work is never done. Yeah. Cause when you come home from work, you do take care of the kids and you want to. Of course. I wanted yeah. to give my kids baths and, and read them stories when I came home from work. I didn't see them the whole day. Right. You know? um, right. The thing, the thing I wanted to make the point of, though, and for worse, is that um, emotional and psychological abuse uh, are just as devastating as physical abuse. You, yeah. you, just, um, you just don't feel justified in um, making a stink about it. Because you think, oh, I'm being thin-skinned, or uh, right. or uh, just just go fight, you know, go go stand right. your ground, fight back, you know. There's there's all these things, and I I wanted to um, make the point that none of these women have been physically abused in any of my chat Now, this is not the case in real life, of course. Of course, yeah. I I I, I don't say you know one is is better, worse, whatever than the other. No, so, we don't shouldn't uh, have to categorize, right? Exactly, but. Um, and I think someone says, you know, there is a tendency if you are being emotionally and physically uh, or psychologically abused to um, to just go along with it because the scars aren't visible. Yeah. Um, I actually, when I first, I think I had a couple of drafts under my belt of this book and I had a friend who was going on vacation with a boyfriend, a rather new boyfriend. And she said, you got anything for me to read on the trip? I said, yeah, take my book. She took her book, my book, and she came back. I said, how's vacation? How's the book? She said, well, she said, I was reading your book and I realized that I was on a vacation with Jeff. Oh, right. And I, I got was shivers. Yeah. And she said she decided she was going to leave early and he had made the plane arrangements and um, I guess bought the tickets. And she said to him, I'm going, it's not working. And she got on the bus to the airport. And when she got to the airport, he had uh, deleted her ticket. So she had no ticket. I mean, he, he, yeah. Her. So, and she said to me, had I not been reading your book, I would not have seen this, the signals. I would not right. have known. So I thought, well, this is powerful. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing too. I think there is, we need, you know, everybody needs to, to feel like their, um, their feelings about something are justified, right? We need to feel like we're not, like you said, we're not being thin skinned. We're not being wimpy. We're not whiny. Uh, we're not like, you know, and it's interesting too, because Jeff, um, was in nine 11, right? I mean, he's, you know, he's a hero. I mean, he lived through something really horrible and he probably has his own story, like what caused him to be the way he is. And, and, and we don't discount that. We're not saying that Jeff isn't, 
that he doesn't have his own stuff that he that is valid and he hasn't been hurt in his own way that doesn't give him permission to do this thing but from the outside of course you know there's many situations where the man is sort of the like in this case actually ellie has a job which i think is very powerful and the more you know i was i was listening to um I don't know if it's Jane Font, one of these fabulous older women who was talking about how the moment a woman doesn't have her own, you know, source of income or or career, she gives up so much power. Yes. And, you know, it's, it's an impossible thing in a world where somebody has to raise our children and two working parents is is hardly sustainable for sort of the kids unless you have parents nearby, which, you know, we never did. And so one parent always has to sort of give um, and be sort of less employed, if you will. Um, mm -hmm. And oftentimes women are just the ones who do it because we have to take maternity leave because we have the baby. Um, and we, you know, there's a bond that happens that the mothers more, you know, more often want to be home. Or if, if not, then the men are often paid more because that's also the setup of the world. And it does immediately put us at this sort of power disadvantage. Um, and I am... One of the things I'm grateful in my divorce is that I always had a career, right? That I'm not, because I do have, all of a sudden I'm 53 and like a half dozen of my closest friends are going through like the exact thing. Their husbands are have been cheating or, you know, whatever. I'm not going to out all my friends, but you know what I'm saying? They, um, a lot of us going through the exact same thing. And some of those women just, they didn't work because that was the setup. And then their husbands, you know, believe that they don't deserve those women, because they didn't work, don't deserve half of the, you know, it's marital a, estate. A, a mindset. Here, I'll take care of you. Oh, you can't take care of yourself? Too bad. You know, that's that's quite, and I think that's, um, when I look back on my child raising years and all my friends, uh, everybody worked and people jumped through all sorts of hoops, night shifts, day shifts, evening shifts, three days on, three days off to um, have a parent or a reliable babysitter at home. It, yeah. it, it's very difficult. I don't imagine it's gonna get much easier. Certainly where I live in Los Angeles, you, you've got to have two incomes. Yeah, know, to, it's a very, I mean, it's a, yeah, it's, it is hard and yeah, and exactly. And the people who don't have, I mean, so I live in Montana where, you know, really a one income family is quite normal. It's much, at least it was, Bozeman's gotten a little insane, but, after the pandemic, everybody thought they wanted to be part of Yellowstone. So, um, but basically, you know, we, we, we did for, you know, a lot of people for a lot of time didn't. And even if, even if I had, you know, women would work, like you said, they would work part time, three days a week, take a night shift. It wasn't the same sort of career trajectory that the men had. And so yes. now that, you know, now when the marriage is ending, you know, there's a sense that the men don't, they, you know, they earned the money. I've actually heard that from my own husband, who I think was very respectful of my job. There were moments in in that negotiation because money makes everybody ugly. Uh, you know, we all, you know, we'll it makes us fight. Sure. <laughs> yeah, it does. And it's, you know, and there were moments where he was like, but I made most of the money. And I was like, I raised most of the kids. <laughs> like, you know, there's and wrote this... 17 books. Yeah. And then 20 17... years. Hello. Yeah, I know. Um but that, you know, it, in an ideal world, that would have been a really, um, that would have been a very stable income. But as we know, um, writing yeah, is not, that. is <laughs> not that it, it is a lot of things uh, and I'm grateful for it, but it is not a stable income. So, yeah. So I think that there is this, there is just, it's, it's set up to make it, um, in a way that makes it hard for women. But one of the things I appreciate with you know, Ellie's relationship with Hannah and the relationship I have with my kids is that when, so, and they're 24 and 22, so they're grown, but when they need something, when they want to talk something through, they call me. And that is a gift. Um, yeah. I feel like I earned it, but that is a gift that I would, I wouldn't trade for, you know, a billion dollars. My yes. children, I have the relationship with them and they're mad at their dad and they will forgive him because he is a really good dad. Um, but that, you know, but I'm their person and I get shivers talking about that. So I feel like Ellie has that too. She has it with Hannah. Yeah. And I just, I, um, I loved Hannah and I remember writing her and I remember not being able to start her chapter because I couldn't get a handle on where to start her. Sometimes I started her with 
being a little kid in New York City, sometimes I started her with how does she feel about her daddy surviving 9-11? Right. And, and then all of a sudden I thought, uh-uh, put her in the present right now on the phone with her texting with her best friend. And all of a sudden I saw her. Yeah. And I knew who she was and what she was doing and where she was. That's actually something that my editor, the great Celia Johnson, she's a freelance editor. She taught me me something really amazing about writing and I'm using it in my second book right now she said um so a lot of my book um Ellie or Jeff would be ruminating about something they'd be thinking oh you know in the past blah 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 or um they'd be thinking about something that that had just happened and they weren't rooted in uh, a space or time that was um visible to the right Right. right. So Celia said, no, no, no. Just put her in the room. You know, describe yeah. where she is. is. She in bed on her laptop? Is the cat there? And all yeah. of a sudden, oh, that's perfect. And she yeah. also said, um, readers forget from chapter to chapter, especially if you're going back and forth between Jeff and Ellie and you're in a chat room, they forget where they left off. And I'm yeah. guilty of that because I read before I go to sleep. And so I conk out after 10 pages. Yeah. And so she said, pick it up from the last chapter yeah you know how does she feel is she thinking about that um and I thought well that's that is such a valuable piece of information and now that I'm reading the other authors that I love everyone's doing it you know that's the the preferred way to do it and I also remember when one of my friends was reading a very very early draft she called me halfway through she said I don't want to stop reading to go look this up who's Wendy <laughs> Right. Wendy's her sister. And then right. I realized if Wendy doesn't show up for 90 pages, you better remind people who she is. Yes. So right. all these ways of grounding the reader and guiding yes. them with a firm hand through your story um, was really valuable to me and went right, along it, changes. People don't want to be, readers don't want to be frustrated. They don't want to have to look back and figure out who Wendy no. is. They don't want to try to figure out where they are. And it doesn't, you know, the funny thing is, as a reader, you don't even really notice how the author has told you, has put right. you in this place and surrounded you because it just, you just take it in. Um, but yeah, I, and I, you know what, I'm however many books in, I'm, I still have these same things. I have to remind myself, where are we? Like what, you know, what is happening? Right. What is uh, and it's and it's it's interesting to write a first book. I mean, so and obviously, you know, now right, you tell us about writing a second book because everybody talks about sort of the pressure because you have all the time in the world to write a first book, right? I mean, yes. it can take yes. as as long as it takes. And a second yeah. book, they're usually like, okay, we'd like this in a year. So how you know, how is that? Well, uh, thankfully, going? my publisher has not said we'd like this in a year, and I don't know how to think about that. I don't know if that's good news or bad news, but my goal is to have it in a, a year. Yeah. Um, and it's, um, it's a, so in for worse, Ellie at her worst moments imagines that she has a lovely husband and she calls him phantom husband and he yeah. pops up occasionally in her imagination. So I thought, what if a woman has a imaginary husband and kind of takes it to the nth degree? Yeah. So that's part of my second novel. Um, but there's also um in 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 for worse, you're sort of heading towards an event. And in this new novel, there's already a there's a body. Mm -hmm. So I have to delve into police procedural, uh -huh. which scares me to death because I really don't want to get on the phone with a policewoman in Boston and say I'm writing a novel. Now I know. I'm sure you've done it. Um, uh -huh. you've done it because I'm reading your books and they're procedurals. And um, you know, but I I get I guess I don't have the confidence as a novelist yet to say, yeah, I'm a novelist and I'm doing research for my novel and I just need to pick your brain for me. Well, there are quite a number of wonderful Facebook um groups about of police officers so because i you know i actually met i was you know my first book came out when i was 29 so i met a police officer through who was married to a woman i work with in finance and mm -hmm. that was my entree because i also i'm a i'm i would be also super awkward to pick up a phone and call um but then i discovered there are really wonderful facebook groups so you could probably find you know a boston police or you can certainly find general police and they yeah. might refer you to somebody but I got referred to like I you know I, I met a 
he was a sort of part of the sharpshooter group. And then I met a sex crimes inspector through him. And then I met a homicide inspector through her. And then I met, you know, so, and that was always, sorry, it was sort of, sort of, sort of passed around from person to person. And to be honest, Lynn, my experience has been that if you write and say that, my, you know, I'm writing a book where the police is a, you know, I, I really want to, I want to make it, I want to make it real. I want the police to show up in a really good way. Like I'm not trying to, I'm not writing the book about the, the crooked cop. Then mm-hmm. they are so happy to t- share with you because oh, that's they, good. they want the cops to show up as good people. They don't want, they get enough bad press right the police are not on everybody's most you know likable list so they really are super generous but in the meantime you can find all sorts of in fact uh you know offline if you um email me or or message me i will find the one that i have referred to sometimes and usually you can get somebody and you can pr- start to private message them you know and just get what you need so oh, that, that's fantastic um, thank you so much yeah. And also a lot of our listeners and readers, it's amazing to me, are, you know, I would think if you were a police officer, the last thing you'd want to do would be read books about your job. But a lot of people are. And I, I did a, um, a whole series about a, um, a medical examiner. Uh, that's the Schwartzman, the X Zoom, the X series, the Schwar- uh, Annabelle Schwartzman. And people reached out and said, I, you know, I work, if you ever need help, I work in a pathologist's office or yeah. I work, you know, which is lovely, you know, because people want to, it's fun to be part of a creative process and people are incredibly generous. So um, in fact, if you're listening to this and you are a police officer or know somebody <laughs> who is a police officer in Boston, leave us a comment, tell Lynn how to, how to get in touch because um, yeah. yeah, we want to get it right. I understand why that's scary. It's all scary. I mean, how it's to awesome. work a gun, how to build a, you know, you're going to build a bomb or use technology or, you know, and we I'm mess just, it up. Of course we do. Even talk to some, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm so um, in awe of the way police talk to people to get their information. They're a little cagey, you know, they know yeah. what they want to keep back and want, and I just, I feel like I don't want to be an idiot, you know, when I, when well, I, right. And I, I, I think, but also like I have found too, to be like, okay, I'm like, I have no police experience you know, I, I, I dream it up in my head, but it's all coming from my head, which means it really there's no official training. So help me get it right. And people are, they really, they are incredibly, um, they're incredibly generous. So there's lots of good places, but I totally understand that. And I understand that there's this, you know, researching while you're writing a book is a funny thing too, because you need to know enough, right? But if you, you can also find yourself down a lot of rabbit holes, right? Oh, God, you're yes, like, yeah. <laughs> three yes, days, you're like, day. I only needed to figure out the difference between a revolver and a pistol. And I hear I am three days down the, the rabbit hole of guns, you know, or exactly. whatever. Exactly. So, yeah. Well, that's exciting. And it's, and are you finding the second, pro- the second book process is, is it different in some way? Is it feel more pressure, less pressure? Um, I feel like there's more pressure um, because you know, I don't know what's going to happen to this book, you know, know. Uh, we'll publish it again or not. And I also feel that um, there's not as much. So when the first book was about a woman with retinitis pigmentosa, and a lot of it is how I feel about having that challenge in my life. And I, a lot of it was expressing my feelings about it, um, which was very um, freeing. And, um, and I hope, educating a bit without being preachy and so this yeah. has not a lot of me personally in it so I'm a little yeah. bit other than the fact that I love my characters and I I uh, I'm committed to to telling their story and I I also think that I'm again in a thematically I'm in a place where a woman or, or two are controlled by their husbands um without being aware of it and the the idea here is not so much um the controlling is the fact that your reality gets skewed when you're in a relationship that is um you're 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 not being filtered the right information from the outside you're in it you don't know what it looks like right so you tell that that you're not in reality so so i think the the arc of these two women are to to is to find their reality the their real reality and not the reality that's right. supposed by someone else 
Right. Well, I mean, I, I mean, it's not, it's not, you know, as you said, it, there's less of you and yet you talk, you know, you're worth universal themes that are, that have so much potency in terms of the, the power of story and also the power of, um, you know, making people who are going through these things feel, you know, feel this, feel the reality of their situation. And hopefully, like you said, maybe, uh, you know, women read these books. I hope they read these books and think, okay, wait, I think I'm in this kind of relationship and, you know, or I was, and I didn't realize, you know, I got out of it, but I got out of it in an ugly way and I'm blamed or whatever. And they get to see it, you know, it from a different perspective and, and hopefully feel somewhat empowered. That's, you know, it's funny that sort of the dance between preaching, you know, about, um, and I don't, I don't hate men. I sometimes think, say that I have to say that more often because I, I all right, of course. I don't either. I, was, I wrote this man who's kind of a monster, but, but I don't hate men at all. Of course not. Right. It's not that. It is, but but I do feel like there's plenty of people, there's plenty of authors who do a really wonderful job of like highlighting the incredible aspects of being a man. Plenty of them. And they've been around for a long time and they've been doing it forever. And so in my mind, like that's not my role. I, somebody else is doing that. My role is to say, is to highlight the sort of dark aspects of what it is to be a woman and this and the fear that goes along with it um you know and the power but but sort of to just like shine a little light on on that in a way that hopefully doesn't feel like you're 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 raising one to bash the other because it isn't a it's a, not a zero-sum game men and women um but i appreciate that with the, the space that you're filling because i think we do need those books and they're they are incredibly you know helpful so Thank you. Answered, is is okay. the new book called um, Phantom Husband? No. Okay. Well, we won't talk about it because you're in the process and we don't want to ruin any of the magic. So, okay. So tell us, where can we find you online, Lynn? Where's the best way to, to connect? Uh, I have a website, uh, authorlkbowen.com. Mm -hmm. That's author, not Arthur. When I first <laughs> created the website, there's an actor from Harry Potter. His name is Arthur Bowen. And every time I typed in author L.K. Bowen, a zillion pages for Arthur Bowen came oh, funny. up. Funny, funny. He's in A U T H R N O R. Yeah, there you go. Um, and then I'm on uh, Instagram at author underscore L.K. Bowen. And then I don't. I'm not on Facebook or Twitter because I just can't. It's too much. Right. Exactly. It's too much. I totally appreciate that. I know it's all too much. It's all too much. We still have to, we have to write books too. Well, Lynn, it was so fun to get a chance to in talk to you today about For Worse. And um, uh, I, I wish you the best of luck with that. Everybody, thank you for joining us today with Lynn Bowen and For Worse, her book out. Such a fun read. April 2nd. Such an, such an evil twist. Um, and we will, uh, we'll see you next time. Bye. Thank you so much, Danielle. Bye-bye.